Welcome everyone to Industry Talks. So glad that you could join us here today. We have for you an amazing panel of industry experts that are going to be letting you know so much about themselves, so much about the media and marketing and entertainment industry. And for the first hour, the way that this is going to run is that we're going to have a panel discussion. You'll get to know a little bit more about all of our amazing panelists who you're gonna hear from really soon. And then you're going to have the opportunity to be in small breakout rooms with each panelist where you'll have the time to ask them one-on-one -on -one questions, whether it's about their trajectory, anything that they may have shared during our um, conversation here, or even if it's questions that you have about learning more about how to get in the industry, each of them have been gracious enough to share um, information about opportunities that they have at their current place of employment. So it's great that you're here to learn more about that. And let's get ready to get started. Again, feel free to utilize the chat if you have any, uh, any additional questions or you can utilize that time um, when we're in the breakout rooms. So welcome to each of our panelists. I'm going to ask you all to please take some, a few, a minute or so to tell us about yourself, your role, your career, and what made you decide to enter this career. And I will just um, call your names out, each one, at least for this first question, and then like, we'll let it flow a little bit for the next ones. So why don't we start with Karan Tachlani. Tell us a little bit about yourself, your role, your career. Well, how did you get here? Of course, yes, happy to kick it off. Um, hi everyone, my name is Karan. I am actually a Macaulay alum, graduated in 2018 from Hunter College, and I studied economics, minored in comp sci and media studies. And currently I am at Peacock, um, Peacock slash NBC Universal where I work in their ad innovation slash product innovation strategy team. Um, and that overall sits under their advertising org. So I can go into a little more detail later on. I think that's one of the questions that we'll talk about, like what, what do we do in our day-to-day? -day? Um, essentially, it's like advertising slash product innovation. I don't know if any of you guys stream Peacock here, but any sort of you know cool ad features that I see that, George, um, any cool ad features that you may see while you are viewing any movies or TV shows, live events on Peacock, um, all those like advertising capabilities are like strategy for them, the go to market messaging for them that's coming from my team. Uh, so I'm currently there as a manager. I started off in this industry actually at Paramount, formerly known as Viacom CBS, formerly known as Viacom. And how I got my start there will be super brief. Um, so others can, so I can go tell other people. But I was an intern there, uh, starting in my junior year of college. And I was there as an intern with credits to Essence, who's here on the panel with me. So this is crazy. Actually, I didn't even know that Essence was going to be in this panel until just today. Um, but yeah, uh, Essence was uh, my recruiter when I applied online in junior year. Prior to that, I was a pre-med, pre-law, pre-finance, investment banking, trying to figure out what I was into. Um, and then again, another story that I can share if more people are interested, but junior year, applied to Viacom, got my internship there, stayed on till senior year in multiple internship roles, um, then came on full time in their advertising sales org, kind of in a very similar role where I am now in ad innovation slash integrated marketing. I was there for about a little more than like two and a half years or so, and then about more than a year ago is when I made the jump over to uh, NBC Universal slash Peacock. So yeah, that's where I am today. Awesome, thank you so much for sharing. So Essence Dash Deray, why don't we hear from you? <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, perfect segue from Quran. So hi everyone, my name is Essence. I am a senior manager at Paramount Global, which as Karan said, we've gone through a bunch of different name changes, but we're home to some networks that you may be familiar with, such as MTV, Comedy Central, Nickelodeon, Paramount Plus, BET, and more. 
Um, I have been with the company for 10 years this year, which is so crazy. Time really flies. Um, I knew I wanted to be in media and entertainment in college. And so I dabbled into a bunch of different internships. Um, I went to school in Virginia, James Madison University. So sort of had to find ways to get that experience, whether through our athletics department, I reached out to local television stations to see if they would offer internship opportunities. Um, but I was afforded the opportunity to intern at Viacom CBS the summer between my junior and senior year in recruiting. Um, and I've been with the company ever since. So I sit in talent acquisition. I'm a recruiter focusing on all of our campus and early career efforts across the organization. So that's anything zero to two years across the org. I absolutely love it. Working with college students and just figuring out what you're passionate about and talking about our brands is what makes my day easy. Um, and so again, being here 10 years has been a really, really easy decision for me. I've been able to work with great students like Karan. And again, it's just so cool to see like where you've landed and, and where other students have landed that I've worked with. So I can jump into my specifics later, but really nice to meet all of you. Thank you so much for sharing that. And again, for always providing opportunities for our students. We love that, love it. Um, Alina Ray, please tell us about yourself. Sure, so I am Alina. I am the brand and product marketing coordinator at Spotify for the songwriters and publishers team. I have a very interesting background. It wasn't in music like a lot of my colleagues. They are all from like music startups. I was working in tech prior to this role, um, but a very like stuffy tech where I couldn't be too creative. And that's something that I realized stayed constant within me throughout my career so far. Um, and in this role right now, I have a lot of creative control when it comes to like making playlists for people, um, engaging with different artists. I am not working with marketing to consumers and listeners. I'm marketing to the actual artists and producers and publishers that also engage with Spotify. Um, it's been really fun and overwhelming so far. This is um, my first like serious, serious post-grad job. So I feel like that will offer you guys an uh, interesting perspective to how I got here. To get into that, I have a podcast. And in my podcast, I feature um, black and brown creatives that I meet in New York City as I'm in my travels. And that's basically what I pitched to them during my interview that got me the role because what I am doing in my own personal life and my creative life is so aligned with what they're doing and their mission on the songwriters and publishers team. Um, and that's like my first piece of advice, like always like have your own personal hobbies and work on that as well, because you never know if your side thing that you do as a creative outlet could become lucrative like it did for me. Such a great story. Thank you for sharing, Alina. And George Torres of George Torres of a Sofrito Media Group, please tell us about yourself. Hey, everybody. Thank you for having me. Um, I'm a digital storyteller. Uh, who started the first Latino website on the internet in uh, 1997 uh, called sofritoforyoursoul.com. Um, today, uh, my business has grown a lot. So I, I started off as a simple blog. I was a club promoter before that in college. Um, I started my, my, uh, my enterprise in, in college and it's grown into a multimedia um, platform uh, where I produce content uh, for major brands in addition to help uh, nurture uh, talent uh, of new and upcoming uh, um, social media influencers and storytellers. Um, today, our portfolio includes Sofrito Media Group, Capicu Poetry in Brooklyn, which is a 15-year-old uh, poet poetry uh, enclave. Uh, we have um, a couple of small e-commerce sites, um, and I also just uh, completed an acquisition of the talent agency that represents me. So I'm becoming a partner in the talent agency that's been representing me for the last couple of years uh, in order to consolidate some of my business interests and in theirs. Uh, so we're becoming a, a bigger, a stronger, bigger company. Um, right now, my dedication is to mostly to helping influencers monetize. Um, that's my, my big focus right now. And I'm in the, uh, the talent development uh, portion of the company once the final, you know, everything's final. So I'll just leave it there. Uh, 
and uh, we'll see what develops throughout the session. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing. I know you'll have some juicy tidbits for us and those of us who want to be uh, paid influencers. So yes. looking forward to hearing that. And Dylan Campbell, please tell us about yourself. Hey everyone, uh, my name is Dylan. Super excited to be here. I am an assistant producer for the New York Times games team. Um, so I work at the intersection of uh, product and content, uh, helping streamline workflows for the crossword editors and working with the product team to improve tooling. Um, so an interesting spot in kind of this intersection of tech and content. Um, before this, I worked uh, in local news mostly mostly in content and tech stuff. Um, I worked at WNYC and New York One before this. So uh, a little bit of a career shift here, but I've been loving it. So happy to talk about any of those things. Super important, yes, thank you for that. So I have a question for anyone who wants to answer um, on the panel currently now, but what is one skill or strategy that has helped you the most throughout your career? I'm, I'm happy to take this one first. Um, I'll rip the bandaid off. Um, I think mostly just saying yes to projects that come my way. Obviously don't overdo yourself, but taking opportunities as they come, even if they seem like they're not fully relevant to you, just to see what that experience is like. Um, for example, like in college, I worked at What to Expect When You're Expecting, which is like a pregnancy news website. Um, and they suggested that I write the copy for our Alexa app. It's not anything that I thought was gonna be very interesting. It was a lot of tedious work, um, but it helped me end up getting a job working on smart speaker content at WNYC, uh, which set me up for this role at the times that I have right now. And it helped me find out that I really like this intersection of new technology, emerging media and content. Um, so I encourage you to just say yes to stuff and see, see how it feels and um, try it out. And if you don't like it, you don't have to do it again. That's my hot tip. I, I will say that um, for me, it's been self-awareness. Um, self-awareness is like the biggest tool that I've deployed uh, throughout my career uh, in all aspects, even, you know, even throughout the first 15 years of my um, of the website and, and the, the media company, I always kept a corporate job. So I worked for uh, FedEx Kinko's uh, for a couple of years. Uh, worked my way up to district manager. I also uh, worked for T-Mobile USA as a senior manager for 10 years. Um, and I helped the, the CEO become one of the best uh, tw uh, Twitter tweeters in the world as far as CEOs are concerned. Um, so self-awareness, because I think that um, a lot of times the things that we're, we feel insecure about when we go into an interview, when we go into a talent acquisition type of situation, the things that we're most nervous about talking about is actually our strengths. So that self-awareness comes in big time. Like telling your story is super huge uh, in today's. People want to know that you're more than just an employee or a robot that could fulfill tasks. They want to know that you have a story, that you have your own passions, and they're going to find out how, I mean, actually, I'm sure Essence could tell you more about how the uh, companies could tap into your passion and actually make you a much better asset to the company. That's so true. We do. We want our makeup. You know, it's we're reaching diverse audiences all over. So the makeup of our organization is really important. You want people from different backgrounds with different diversity of thought and passions and interests. So spot on, George. I'll add on by saying that a soft skill that has been really instrumental for me since, since being in college is um, be having the willingness and the comfortability or the comfort to ask questions. Um, because since my first internship at Viacom, uh, you know, just being fresh in that media space, you know, thinking back then, like I did not know anything about kind of the behind the scenes of what goes on in terms of like sales or research or marketing. Um, of course, I knew it from a very holistic level, but not, you know, how, what do people do on a day to day when they come in the morning and before they leave for in the evening? Um, so I really took it upon myself as an intern, which is, you know, an advice that I would give to everyone. Um, meet with a lot of people for um, like informational chats for just, you know, quick coffee chats 
um, and ask a lot of questions, uh, both with those people who you're meeting, you know, just to learn about their job and internally with your own team. Um, if you're presented with a task and not, you don't, you're not sure, you know, how to proceed with it. I've always kind of taken upon myself to like, okay, let me break down what I do understand. Let me set aside what I don't understand and really go back to, you know, whoever I'm working with um, to ask questions about, about that role. And that has been super helpful to me just in terms of um, getting a wider knowledge set of the industry and also just me just growing as um, a professional in the industry, like, because only by asking questions and then soaking in the answers that you're hearing back from people um, is when you can apply that to your work and then, and then in turn put out good work that after that, you know, sets you forward in the next stage. So yeah, ask lots of questions. I'd like to add something going back to like the topic of passion. I definitely feel like something that helped me is making sure that I aligned with whatever role that I was applying for, just so I don't waste my time or theirs. And I feel like it can be felt in an interview when you're not like really there and you're not aligned with their mission. So knowing that information and doing a deep dive before you send in that application, waste your time on a cover letter, like have enough information about the employer. Yeah, most company sites do have an area for mission, vision, values, um, even like if diversity is top of mind for you, you can find all that information there. So if you're not seeing it on the site, do make sure like you're asking recruiters about it. Ask the hiring managers you're meeting with. You spend so much time at work. So you do want to make sure that the company that you're working for aligns with the, some of the things that are important to you as, as a person. Um, even just thinking about Karan's piece with asking questions. I love that. I will say that's probably even the hardest piece of being virtual is you have to be more intentional about your outreach because you're not in the office. And so you don't have that natural, just like passing by someone's desk or their cubicle. So um, sometimes you have to be a little bit more intentional about that outreach. But again, don't be afraid to ask questions um, if they come up or their Slack, email, whatever it might be. Another thing that I wanna add about like being intentional, something that I'm doing right now as I'm in this new role is I'm scheduling with everyone that I see in multiple different meetings throughout the day. Like, and I would recommend this if you're an intern right now as well. Um, if you see someone frequently, try to schedule like a one-on-one -on -one with them for like 30 minutes. I, to make things less awkward, created like a small presentation about like my personality, the music that I'm listening to because it is Spotify, my favorite genres, books, movies. Um, just tidbits about myself to make things a little less awkward and intimidating when you first start um, and you get to know a lot about who you're working with as well and that's super important. You all share some really great points and that was actually one of the questions that I was going to ask because it's a pandemic right it's zoom it's not always being in the office or maybe still working from home or going in maybe one or two times a day if at all so what are some ways that um if anyone else has any other tips or what are some ways that you can ask someone for um a virtual coffee meeting or those kind of things does anyone else on the panel have any other ways of how to you know maybe contact a recruiter or how to just even build relationships it at your internship or any place of employment while we're in this weird space of the pandemic. Yeah, I um I my company went virtual two years before the pandemic because I had decided to travel and become nomadic in, in, in nature. Um so most of what we do is is uh virtual uh all the time. Um I think that uh being someone who adds value to the other person is a great way to break into a relationship. So when you introduce yourself finding out like what can I do for you? as opposed to like, I want to know more about Spotify. How can I get my music played? <laughs> you know, um, you know, let them know that, you know, what what your relationship is with the brand that they're, that, you know, I'm talking in the, in the concept of brands. Let them know what your relationship is to the brand. So I'll give you an example. A couple of years ago, I had been working with a, a, a Guayabera company, a shirt company, and they had been furnishing all my shirts for my speaking engagements and my fireside chats. And that company was going through some hard times and they couldn't no longer provide me for the shirts. 
but I've already built a brand around wearing these really colorful and really popular shirts at all of my events, right? It was my uniform, so to speak. I didn't wear suits. Um, so I reached out to uh, a company called Cuba Vera, which was acquired by Perry Ellis, which I didn't really want to go high end. I really like working with a smaller brand, but I really needed something in a pinch. And they were the only ones that I could leverage quickly, uh, quickly show them, say, hey, listen, you know, I really love your shirts. Here are a couple of the shirts that I own from your from your line. And I just want to know if at some point in time, you know, we could have a conversation about partnership. Legit in three days, I got a shipment of 105 shirts. Like I didn't get payment for it. And that was the trade off, right? That was the building relationship part. It was like, okay, well, let's see how we can work together. Well, here's a sample of everything that we have in our current line. <laughs> and uh, they got it to me in my size and, and it was just really cool. You know, and I ended up showcasing about 12 pieces over the next year. Uh, and then that led to paid opportunities down the line. Um, but it was really like, okay, well, I'm in a pinch. You guys want to promote this. I already have the audience that's looking for this particular type of cultural shirt. Uh, and it's a, you know, it's a, it's a win-win for both of us. Uh, so making sure that you have something to add a value instead of just asking for something uh, for yourself. That's a really great tip. Thank you for sharing that. So another question for anyone on the panel, um, what are some common misconceptions that people often have about the media or marketing industry? I would, I can kick this off. Um, so a lot of people don't understand that there are multiple facets to what is media. Um, I will speak of personal experience, like, you know, obviously being at Macaulay, being involved in like the business club and all these different, you know, pre-business, pre-professional forums. Um, a lot of people like my friends were in finance or in accounting or something else. A lot of people were shocked to know that those things are legit careers in media as well. So I actually helped one of my friends who went to JP Morgan out, out of college. She became an, she was an analyst for wealth management. She absolutely hated working in finance as a bubble. I ended up referring her to one of my friends who was at Disney, who I'd known back in my intern days. And now she works in like compensation management at Disney and she absolutely loves it. Um, so I feel like that's a very common misconception. Like when people think about careers in media and marketing, they just think about the creative output that they see on their own screens. Um, but there are, li there are literally so many skills and business lines that go into the overarching media world um, that I definitely like encourage, you know, every, all the students here to really dig go on the company websites, look at, you know, their about us sections, see what their lines of business are, go on their career site and see like when you filter by function, what are those actual functions? Um, and then it, it gives you an impression of, okay, you know, if I'm an accounting major or if I'm, if I'm really, if I want to be more like numbers oriented, but I'm really interested in media, then maybe I can go into research or some data analytical space. Um, so that's something that I learned very early on, like, okay, there are very, there are a lot of different nuance um, business lines here. Um, and something that I still tell students who I meet with today, like, do your research. If you are into finance, you don't have to go into iBanking. If you're not that into it, go into something that you're passionate about, because I guarantee you, you will find somewhere where you can fit in. I remember the first time I went to a hackathon, the students were like, what are you guys doing here? I'm like, Nickelodeon, we have like apps and games. And, you know, like we have a team of, you know, iOS and Android developers that are like creating this content. And they're like, oh, wow. I like never even thought about that. So. Yeah, I think that's a really excellent advice. And some of my like favorite jobs that I've had have been ones that I didn't find like on LinkedIn. I found by going to the company website for places that I loved like WNYC and, and just looking at the career page and seeing like what I would qualify for and what I would like doing. Um, because there are so many new and emerging job titles and fusion jobs like the one that I have that you might not necessarily find when you're just searching around on LinkedIn that you would need to see just by peering around on the career page. So I think that's great advice. Great, thank you for sharing that. Um, 
with all that's going on with the recent pandemic, um, how have you navigated your career throughout it um, and had to deal with like unexpected challenges or obstacles brought on by COVID? Has it had any impact on like the work that you do or like getting into the industry and things like that? I will go first. I graduated in 2020, so virtual graduation for me. And it was super difficult to find work during that time. Um, I definitely didn't do as many internships, I feel like, as I should have when outside was completely open. So it was a little bit more difficult for me to like get my footing on after college um, and in the first couple months of the pandemic. But um, I just kept applying to internships and positions. And eventually like I got something from in the tech world, which is where I wanted to go. But again, not as rigid as like AI and like aerospace. I wanted to do something a bit more up my alley like music. Um, but yes, it was definitely, I feel like post-grad like issues were a thing that I knew about from my friends that had graduated in 2018 and 2019 and that they were upset because they didn't get a job. They didn't jump into a swivel chair as soon as they walked across the stage. And that was even more unrealistic if you graduated in 2020 because of all of the hiring freezes. Um, so that was definitely different than what I expected my post-grad experience to be. I think that uh, for us, since we were already remote, um, we didn't have that learning curve that a lot of companies had to kind of jump into and figure out how to use. And the rest of the world had to catch up in terms of the skills, the soft skills that they needed to actually be able to be a good employee and show up for work uh, as the world changed. Um, so for us, we found an opportunity in training which is the, the new business model for the, the new business I just launched is Siembra Academy is called Grow Academy, uh, the, the translation. And uh, part of it is just training people on how to deploy uh, different aspects of media to get their message across in a world that may remain kind of similar to what we've experienced in the last two years. So for us, it was a great opportunity. We lost tons of money the first three to six months, uh, but we made it back 3x uh, in, the, in the last year and a half. Uh, so that was a big opportunity for us. I love that, the opportunity piece, because as a recruiter, I will say um, last year was tough. There was a freeze, and I felt for all of our interns that were looking for full-time opportunities. Um, but it's been nice actually being in this virtual space now because I'm able to consider candidates all across the U.S. And before, I was looking specifically New York and L.A., and those, as we know, it's really expensive, um, you know, like, not everyone has the means to be able to afford to live in those cities. So for me, it's been amazing to be able to like hiring students and uh, recent grads that live in, you know, wherever it might be across the U.S. and they still have the opportunity to work with us. So that's been really nice, sort of just leveling the playing field a little bit. Thank you for sharing. And if we're looking at right now, um, what is the job market like for this career or related jobs to similar to what you have now for all of our students who are on or recent alumni who may be looking to break into a role that's similar to yours or even to the company you're at now? What is the job market looking like now? I mean, it's hot, if that, that's the one word to put it in. Um, at NBC in particular as well, like I just um, got through a process of hiring a coordinator for my team. Um, and I, I remember like I, I reached out to you, Emily and Gia to spread the word about the role. Um, and just in terms of, you know, across the board in the industry, like I'm still seeing, like I get alerts on LinkedIn all the time, like hiring XYZ. I see friends making jumps every other week, like someone who I know from um, X company will go on to a tech company or someone from like media is now going into like some startup or et cetera, et cetera. So very hot. Um, I will say that definitely do your due diligence 
of the role that you are interested in. Um, like, although the job is hot, does not mean that you apply to everything under the sun. Um, as I know as a new student, it can be very tempting to do that. I mean, not a new student, as a new grad, it can be very tempting to do that. Um, but definitely, you know, like refine sort of your interests, kind of, you know, be nuanced in what you are applying for. Like if you know in a general sense that you're into a marketing function, then look for like those marketing function roles. If you know that you are into numbers, then look for, you know, different functions that cover like data, research, et cetera. Um, so yeah, kind of be mindful when you apply and also uh, leverage your network when you apply. Like because the job market is so hot, there are employees at those companies that they are in return, like they are eager to get new people in. So reach out to your network, um, you know, reach out to alumni, reach out to your career center um, and get advice in terms of, you know, who can be a good person? Do you know someone who I can talk with? Um, so yeah, it, it's a very hot market for sure. I always lean on the alumni piece. If you are looking to get, maybe share your resume with someone and you've applied to a certain company, like check on LinkedIn to see if there are any alum that are working at said company. Um, and when you do reach out to someone on LinkedIn, because some of us are inundated with messages, I would recommend going, like have an action item, you know, hi, my name is XYZ. Like I've noticed that you are also an alum of Macaulay Honors. You know, I've applied to this role at your company. Would love if you could flag my resume for the recruiter. You know, the, this is the job ID number. Here's the link. Like, I really appreciate your time. Um, additionally, if you had 15 minutes for a coffee chat, you know, I would love the opportunity. So just always make sure if you are messaging someone on LinkedIn, I would have an action item. And rather than ask, hey, just, you know, I'm a recent grad, what opportunities exist at your company? Say, I had the chance to browse your site. I was really excited about this role and I was hoping you could flag my application for someone. And if you're looking to get into HR, we um, there's a lot of opportunities. We're actually hiring a, a huge team right now within TA, um, just given the, the way streaming is sort of like just continuing to, to, to grow. Um, but usually you would come in as like a recruiting coordinator, um, an HR coordinator. We also have sourcers. So check out the site if you're interested. Thank you so much for sharing that piece. I think that's, that's critical because it, especially it's, the message lands differently on someone's inbox when you're sliding in their DM, then it shows that you did the work because you look for a specific position. So it's not like, hey, can you do me a favor and tell me what's available? It's like, no, I'm really into this because I saw this role. I want this role. I'm qualified for this role. And can you flag my application? And then, you know, of course, like how George um, mentioned earlier about and what can I do for you and those things, if you do get a conversation, really go a long way. So thank you so much for sharing that part. <clears throat> and then... So once you get the job, right, because that's the ultimate goal, to, do any of you have advice for ways that um, you can progress in your field and in your line of work, right? So once you get that, you did the internship, you got hired at your internship, but you got hired at a job, what are some ways that our students watching now can um, move up in the ranks and progress in their roles and in their career? Any tips for that or suggestions? Yeah, I like this one. So I always like to be the wallflower, right? I would go into networking meetings all the time and just watch people interact with each other to see what drives them. You know, in networking meetings, people walk up to each other, they shove their business card in your face and, you know, back when, before the pandemic, right? Um, but I think that um, just don't let, don't, don't let on, a lot of people walk into new jobs and they want to say how much they know. I would just say, go in there and just listen to everybody, watch everybody, pretend you don't know anything and then just hit them when it, hit them with the right thing at the right time. You know what I mean? Show them your skill set in in, at the right time. Uh, because uh, a lot of times when you come in and you say that you know, you're actually blocking the opportunity to learn something a different way. Yeah, I think especially in 
media, it's important to take some time to like shadow how everyone works and ask a lot of questions and learn about the culture um, before you kind of approach with suggestions. You want to make sure that your ideas are, you know, well thought out and will be presented in the way that makes sense. Um, so I would say, that, you know, schedule a lot of one-on-ones, ask uh, people that are in, in slightly higher positions than you or on your level that you should to like, can I shadow you? Can I spend some time watching you do this thing? Um, you know, I'm interested in learning more. And I think those kind of like one-on-ones and that observation can be really helpful in learning kind of how the culture works and um, how you can grow. I also suggest that you try and find a mentor and ask them about like the career ladder at that company, if they have a really specific one um, and, you know, take a look at it and all of the options and see like, okay, if I want to go from, you know, assistant producer to producer, here are the things that I need to be hitting. Um, and these are the things that I kind of need to do. That way you can ask questions and try and uh, take on those opportunities if they arise. So that's my advice. Awesome, thank you for sharing. So this next question is for Essence. Um, what I will share is that our interns did go on your LinkedIn and find a little bit more about you and had um, some specific questions for each of you. So this one is for Essence, but once you hear the question, anyone else can feel free, of course, to chime in. So um, you mentioned in your bio that you're an active member of the Beat Plus, which is a Black employee research group and via community. Um, which is a community service arm at Viacom CBS. Could you tell us a little bit more about um, employee resource groups, like your um, experience in participating in them and being a part of them, um, and any advice that you would have for students who are from historically underrepresented groups in media and marketing? Yeah, absolutely. Great question. Um, and I know that other organizations, I think we've actually partnered with New York Times and Spotify, um, a lot of companies have employee resource groups, which is awesome. I remember in college, I was so involved on campus and, you know, graduating school. I, as I said, I grew up in Virginia. So moving to New York, it was my first time. And I was really worried about losing that sense of self, losing that community that I had been so used to in college. So coming to um, Viacom CBS, I found out about these ERGs. Actually, we were doing, a, I was going to a career fair at Howard and I had brought an employee with me who was an alum and we started talking about events and she's like you know I'm a part of the black ERG we're getting ready to host this huge event that we do every year um it's like a giving back giving back initiative would you like to get involved and I didn't look back since I um, was a part of one of the working groups so obviously black history month is our marquee but throughout the year we do other events around professional development business learnings um, various workshops. We will network with other Black ERGs across different companies and different industries, but it gave me really great access and visibility across the organization. Um, Chris McCarthy, who is the president of MTV Entertainment Group, was our champion. So just to have FaceTime with him was amazing. Um, and just being able to listen to our employees and like what they were passionate about, who they wanted to hear from, what workshops we could bring in to be able to create those and put them on for this large conglomerate um, has been extremely rewarding. We have hosted some amazing events. My favorite that I always uh, mention is we had Colin Kaepernick come speak just about not only his, his career as an athlete, but just his personal story, you know, all the great work that he's doing right now. Um, it was like just an amazing, con no phones were allowed, which was nice too. Like, you know, people were just really in the moment listening to him. But um, again, I can't say enough great things. You should definitely ask when you're meeting with someone if there are different organizations or ERGs that you can participate in. Um, we have seven different ones. So we have the Beat Our Black ERG. We have um, a Latino Hispanic ERG, uh, Asian Pacific, one for women, one for working parents, um, one for the next generation. It's the names change a little bit Thursday, think. And I'm blanking on more. But anyway, they're fantastic. I highly, highly recommend. Um, and by a community, that's just like our volunteer arm. So it's different ways that you can get involved. But I think I covered all the questions there today. If not, happy to come back to it. Yes, and I see in the chat that some um, some of the other panelists have also like chimed in about participating in ERGs and the importance of it. So thank you for yeah. that. Yeah, absolutely. My whole, my whole company is at ERG. There you go. I love that. <laughs> yeah, I think it's really great to find ways at work to be able to get involved, whether it's um, 
um, for a specific group or like an identity of something, but also like being able to be involved in things that are more than just the bullet points of your job description, right? We spend so much time at work that like, how, why not find other ways to like be involved that don't only involve your, um, yeah. your day-to-day functions. And you don't, again, you don't have to be affiliated with a specific group to join it. Anybody's welcome. Um, I mentioned LGBTQ plus, that was our other group pride that I forgot to mention. Um, but yeah, it's, it was, it's been fantastic being a part of it. So I am grateful for that. Wonderful. So this next question is for George. Um, in your personal mission statement, it says that you're um, passionate about con- con- connecting Latinos to their culture. Okay. Um, and that that's part of the creative vision for Sofrito Media Group. Can you share with us what was the inspiration behind this mission statement? And do you feel that recent films such as Encanto are in line with your vision of media development and recognition of Latino culture? Oh, that's a loaded one. I love it. Um, yes, uh, Encanto is the perfect example of what I dreamed of when I started Sofrito for Your Soul. Uh, not only because of the fact that it's a Latino story with Latino representation, but all the talent that went into producing the film was also Latino, Latinx, um, and people of color. Um, So that to me is, is, you know, that's the the big picture, right? Um, How the the website began was uh, out of activism, right? I love Latino culture and I hated the fact that our stories weren't told in, in, in our history books. And when I discovered the, the HTML platform, like the platform WWWs or the World Wide Web, I decided to be able to start sharing small stories. I started off with poetry actually, and it kind of went viral from there and viral at that time without social media. So that's, that's, that's the other piece of it. So it went from me sharing my poetry to people submitting their own poetry to asking me to, to judge it, which I would never judge poetry, but that, that's the request they would have, to producing and and um, and promoting poetry events. And then the music came in, then the food came in, and next thing you know, in the college scene, uh, I kind of ran the Long Island Latino, like all the festivals. Uh, I, I worked on all different types of projects. I was the first um, outside source to help with the first Latin American exhibit that featured artists, the masters like uh, Frida Kahlo and whatnot uh, at the Nassau County Museum of Art. Uh, And we just kept building from that. Um, One of the things that was really huge for us that took us to the next level was the fact that we started a project, a kindness project for soldiers who were in Desert Storm. And uh, we had all these uh, different organizations, mostly mothers and and, and, uh, uh, local grassroots organizations getting together cultural candy to send to soldiers that were uh, away from home. So the, the website, you know, we just kept growing from that. So producing events and just continuing to find different ways for people to tell their stories, to celebrate culture, uh, to find uh, um, connectivity uh, with even if they're second, third generation. Um, and then most importantly, you know, one of the things that like to having conversations that we normally don't have, like racism within Latin America, conversations like that, conversations about machismo and marianismo, um, you know, the patriarchy, you know, talking about mental health and things of that nature. So we, we really challenged a lot of things early on in the game. Uh, I then became a, produ- a, a, a ghost producer for a company called Community Connect that ran uh, three different platforms that predated Facebook and MySpace called um, uh, Black Planet, Mi Gente, and Asian Avenue. Uh, so because of what I was doing, they actually offered to buy my company, but because I really didn't have a company, it was just a website that I was doing as a, as a hobby. Um, I then decided to leverage, uh, the talent that they thought I had into, uh, into actually helping produce better content for them and and helping them steer their direction in the digital space while, while West five years before my space ever became a thing. So it was pretty cool stuff. It's good to be first because you don't have anybody to measure yourself after, you know? Yes. Thank you for sharing that. Um, and this next question is for Karan. Please tell us um, a little bit about your experience in transitioning from one major media corporation to another. Very good question. Um, I see Essence. Your secret's safe with me, Karan. <laughs> <laughs> She's very interested to know what I have to say. Okay. Um, well, the transition itself, I will say, 
it was not bad at all. Um, and kind of, you know, speaking in a more general sense, like when you change companies um, in your career, often, you know, it can be very like daunting, like, you know, you're going from one space that you got so familiar with for such a long time, and you're going to a new space, which it's essentially a new chapter of your life, you know, you have to meet new people, get them to know you and how you work so that, you know, you can leave good impressions on them. And then um, basically, you know, you're, you're starting all over. For me, I feel like I kind of lucked out because the role that I ended up going into here at Peacock is very, very similar to the role that I was doing at Viacom. Um, the only difference being, though, is kind of like the, the purview of the role. Like before, I was in ad sales and ad innovation for all the, all the networks and all the platforms that Viacom oversees. So that includes like, you know, linear stuff, linear as in like regular TV, um, digital stuff. Uh, and then when we merged with CBS, I was also very much involved in like CBS Sports, CBS News, CBS All Access, which eventually became Paramount Plus. Um, at Peacock, I am exclusively on streaming, like streaming advertising, streaming ad innovation, streaming product development, um and so that i will say was kind of like the biggest learning point for me just like you know how does this side of a business that's you know very very recent for these larger media corporations like you know they're trying to keep up with the netflixes they're trying to keep up with the youtubes um and i would say keep up is a is an old term they are here Every, everyone's pretty much in par now um so i will say it was kind of like the the purview of what i was seeing was kind of like the most learning experience for me but the actual role itself in my case it wasn't that different it was just like a switch of people uh company wise i will say the cultures are different um at viacom and paramount today uh definitely you know very much i felt at least like very lax very much you know um in tune with cult in, in tune with like modern culture in tune with um, you know, if you're working with somebody who's younger than you, who's older than you, like very people oriented bunch at NBC, I will say people are a little more buttoned up. Uh, they are a little more kind of slow moving and not slow moving is a bad word, but kind of like very strategic in everything that happens, which was a big learning experience for me, like having spent four years at a company like Viacom, like, you know, working on things that MTV and Nickelodeon are doing, and then going over to, you know, something that's like a pivot away from that. Um, so yeah, a little bit of a culture shock in the beginning, but then you eventually learn that everyone in advertising in particular um, is pretty much kind of built the same. So then I, it did not take me long to kind of get adjusted to that piece of it. Um, yeah, I hope that was helpful. Yes, of course. Thank you for sharing. So Alina, when you were talking in your intro, you mentioned being able to utilize your podcast to leverage um, landing this role that you now have at Spotify. Um, as a product and brand coordinator. So do you have any tips for anyone here listening who wants to start their own podcast? Yes, I do. Um, I created my podcast because I needed a creative outlet during the pandemic. Um, it was a time where I didn't really know the next step in my career. Um, and a lot of my peers that graduated in 2020 were also like at a standstill in life. Um, and I was like, what can I do that's like not work related that I can use to de-stress? Um, and I stumbled across this app called Anchor that it's like a, it's an iOS app and you could also use it on your desktop as well. And it's created by Spotify, surprisingly. I did not think in 2020 when I was using that after I'd eventually like be working there and speaking to the developers of that app. Um, but some tips for making one, I would say if you have any like very niche interest, um, creating like an outline of what you wanna speak about, um, reaching out to people that have similar interests, um, 
I think with you, Emily, I think you sent me a DM because I created my own ad, which was a bit overwhelming. Some story about that. I created like a paid ad on Instagram and I was saying, hey, I am taking creative from New York City. I want to speak to you guys and hear your story um, so you can inspire other people that are aspiring creatives. And I got such an overwhelming response that it was like, I couldn't even get to everybody. Um, so that's one avenue that you can go down if you want to reach out to people that way. Um, at times, I would just send cold emails. If I found someone's like LinkedIn, I'd be like, hey, I really like what you're doing. Um, and I feel like it aligns with me. So can, can we schedule a chat? Can you be my podcast, maybe? Um, and then it got to a point where people were just randomly reaching out to me and sending me like their own pitch decks. And at that time, I had no idea what a pitch deck was. So I was just like, what's going on? Like, I didn't know that what I was creating was like reaching people that much because I was doing it for myself in a way, but also for other people that were struggling with that, with that post-grad blues on top of us being in a pandemic. Um, and just like going for it, I feel like I, for a lot of years, was a podcast consumer and I was thinking about doing it and thinking about doing it. And I just wasn't. And then the pandemic happened and it was like, what else are you going to do? Like you're in the house. It's just you and your laptop. So why not? And I just did it without like thinking too hard, had a, a small little outline of what I wanted to say. And then from then I just kept going, kept reaching out to people and eventually like the people on Spotify listened to it. Like my manager told me to listen to it. And I was just like, um, girl, those are my personal thoughts. <laughs> like, wait a minute, I don't even work there yet. Um, but me having a personal mission that aligns with them that they could see and they saw that I wasn't just like, I, I wanna work here because you guys are hiring and I need a job. It was, I wanna work here because this is something that really hits home to me. I love speaking to creatives and being around that energy it's super inspiring for me especially emerging songwriters which is who I'd be working with the most at Spotify because it's just a lot more authentic and organic nothing's really curated with them because for the most part they don't have that big team um to wrap this up because I feel like I'm going on a tangent um just knowing what you like and knowing what interests you and also understanding that that can change is super important when you're making a podcast. Such wonderful tips. Thank you so much, Alina. And then my question for Dylan is that, so you were a morning news producer for New York One and a so assistant producer at WNYC. Now you're at New York Times, which is print media. How have you liked the transition from television media to now print media? Yeah, I've tried everything, haven't I? Um, so I think the the transition was interesting and and different for me because in my role at WNYC, my role here, they're much more similar where I'm touching content and tech. Um, so those roles actually feel very similar despite making a print product versus a radio product. Um, being a producer for morning TV felt very, very different and it's a different pace. Um, but it was an interesting experience. I mean, getting up at 2.30 in the morning will teach you a lot about yourself um, and your coworkers. Um, but it was, it was really, really fun. And I think like transitioning is just about what I was saying earlier, where you go in and you, you spend some time waiting and listening and being a wallflower and absorbing um, and trying your best to figure out where you fit into that like environment um, because they're all gonna be very, very different. Um, so I think, transitioning from all of them. I just followed that same process and made it, it made it much easier to kind of fit in. Um, and I really liked what we were just talking about, how your what you like can change um, and that's okay. I mean, I've tried all three. I found out where I like to be um, and there was a lot of like emotional, emotional turmoil and figuring that out, but it's okay that like, you know, you wanted to be in print and then you ended up being in radio and then you ended up being in TV and then you ended up being back in print, but in a different way. So. Um, I would just take the advice of like, try everything, see what you like. If you don't want to stay, you don't have to stay. Um, and just, you know, try to learn and, and figure out where you fit in, in the environment. 
I hope that answered the question, but I like where I am now. Good. I mean, you can't know you don't like something or do like it without trying it and experiencing, right? So yeah. and you're not going to hurt anyone's feelings if you don't like it. Everyone wants you to work somewhere that you like. Or yes, definitely. If you put in that work, if you're putting in the work and really showing your value as an employee, to Dylan's point, it will not hurt anyone's feelings. And the 100% you will see the support um, and encouragement of you maybe wanting to try something out. Or, I mean, again, a lot of, I'm sure for each company, you can speak to like the mobility that happens across different groups and functions. So, so that does exist too. Yes. So I've got one last question for all of the panelists before we transition into the small breakout rooms where you'll each be able to speak with them um, in small groups and be able to ask them a little bit more intimate questions. Um, so the last question is, what is one piece of advice you would want students here to walk away with? And anyone can answer. I can start. Um, I know like last year, this year has been crazy. Um, even again, just working with um, soon to be grads, I know applying to jobs is really stressful. You may have friends that are in consulting or banking or tech, and they've known a year ago, two, year ago, two years ago that they have a job, right, lined up for them after college. Just know, like, your journey is unique to you. Do not stress. Do not compare yourself to others and worry about, you know, this friend has this job and someone already knows. And just you're going to stress yourself out so much thinking about all those things. So just remember, again, like, your journey is unique to you. And I know it sounds cheesy, but, like, things will fall into place when they're supposed to. And good luck. And here's a resource if you need. I, I would say value your relationships in every aspect. Um, you always hear the term, don't burn bridges. No, build bridges. Continue to build bridges with everybody. That person that's in the mailroom today may be the person hiring you tomorrow. Like it, the world and media is very, very volatile at times. And that could be good because it creates a lot of opportunity for people who are hungry who have that hustle in them. Um, so yeah, so absolutely just, you know, be kind to everybody and just build those bridges as you go along. Uh, one advice I will leave students with is always keep your resume up to date. You never know when you may be in a chat and suddenly a friend will say, oh yeah, send me your resume tonight. I'll share it with one of my friends and they can pass it on to somebody who they know. Um, so always keep it, you know, very like clean formatted PDF, make sure wherever you send it is always as a PDF. Um, make sure, you know, your adjectives on your resume are strong. They speak to like the results that you achieved in previous roles, uh, not just, you know, the actions that you did and utilize the Emily and Career Center uh, to do resume reviews. I definitely did that when I was a student at Macaulay. Um, and yeah, uh, keep one last piece about resumes before this other thing. Um, make sure you're matching bullets to, to whatever extent that you can with job postings that you apply to, especially for entry-level roles and especially at large corporations um, where you know they may receive a lot of candidates for entry-level roles. Um, having matching with you know with keywords what they're looking for sometimes recruiters may filter out by certain keywords depending on like the skills of a job versus you know what's needed um make sure you have those keywords that a job posting may have so that it also sticks out for the recruiter as well um the second piece of advice that i was uh, i was getting at is um leverage your network um a referral can very well make a difference. Um, it didn't for me in this transition that I made to NBC. That honestly, I applied online and I got it. So that was, uh, I, I'm still kind of like in, in, in awe that that happened. But in my first role, I feel like it's, it's all connected. In my first role, uh, when I was going from internship to full-time at Viacom, I remember I had reached out to Essence that, hey, I applied to this full-time role. Um, I just graduated last month. It's very interesting. Can you please find my resume? At the same time, I had reached out to a VP who I met as an intern 
um, who I just became, you know, instantly close with. I, cl I clicked with them uh, very strongly. I reached out to him and I said, hey, I don't know if you know this team, but I'm applying to this role. Uh, it turns out, like, I ended up getting that role. About a year into the role, suddenly my boss was like, um, oh, yeah, you know, I don't remember how that exact conversation was, but I remember she told me like way into like me being in that role with her that, oh yeah, I didn't even, I wouldn't even have hired you if I hadn't gotten your resume from this person. So it, it worked for me. And then that experience in itself, because I had that experience in my belt, I don't think I would have just gotten past the traditional online application zone for my next state, like for where I am at NBC. So everything is a stepping stone, but at the bottom step, my network was a key part of it. So leverage your network where you can, make those connections, try to be as organic as you can. Um, yeah. Thank you so much for I'm sharing right that. Anything else in the last 30 seconds? Because we are about to transition into our breakout rooms and we want to make sure that you have enough time you know, for each um, breakout. One more thing, which is something that I struggle with is do not let imposter syndrome win. You have the resume. Once you get hired, you got hired because you had the right credentials and you wouldn't be in that position if you did not deserve. So that's my last little piece. Great, thank you. So how is this gonna work? Thank you to all of the panelists. Thank you to all for being here. We are not done. We are just done with the first portion. So the way that it's going to work is in about 30 seconds or less, as soon as I'm done talking, all, everyone is going to be put into a breakout room. So all of the people, students, alumni, everyone that's here um, watching us, you are going to be put into a room and you are going to stay in that breakout room, whether in your room one, two, three, four, or five. And what's going to happen is our amazing panelists here, all five of them, they are going to be put into a room. Um, I, I can't hear Emily. I'm not muted. Oh, oh now you're muted. Yeah, we can hear you now. Oh, so weird. I was like, I was not muted. Okay. So what I was basically saying was that um, we're going to have five breakout rooms. So all everyone who's in the audience, you're going to be put into a room and you are going to stay in that room. Our five amazing panelists, they're the ones that are going to be switching about every 10 minutes, maybe a little shorter now that we're over a little bit on time. They're going to be switching um, to the different rooms. So students, alumni, stay here, stay in the room that you're put into and the, the every you're going to have a chance to meet with every single panelist. Okay. So now we're ready for breakout rooms. Thank you so all so much for being here.